Hello. Oops, Hello, I can't. Send... Howdy. Hey, now I can hear there you. There we go. Yep. The Zoom link to the channel. Thanks again for moving this to a UK friendly time for me. I appreciate it. Okay. Oh, it's not a problem. I mean, we put it in the afternoon just to begin with because we didn't have any Europeans um, <laughs> joining us and um, knew that we might have to move it. You know, but for all of us who are here in the US, particularly in the west coast of the US, we have this thing where our mornings are packed full of stuff and our afternoons are pretty much free. So. Yep. I have the opposite yep. thing. Like anytime I can schedule something in my morning because my mornings are wide open and then there's this chunk of US overlap that's just booked solid every single day. Yep, the, um, yeah. Um, I'd rather have that, honestly, because um, I think I would get more non-meeting work done. So my problem is always, you know, after having five hours of meetings, I'm pretty much wiped out. Yeah. It actually works really well for me because I, I tend to work better on focused work in the morning anyways. And so it's really nice to have this chunk of time where I can just get stuff done. And then, and then have all my meetings. So then you guys just get me when I'm sleepy and tired of working all day. But, but it I'm does. Like, it does better for me. I'm smack in the middle between the two of you. <laughs> I'm on the East Coast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You don't really get a nice chunk. You get like all your meetings are, yeah, sort of in the middle. You probably don't get a lunchtime. <laughs> Okay, so we have a relatively short agenda, um, although um, there's likely to be some discussion. Um, so one is um, we have sort of an outline for, uh, we've got the content development issue. Um, we have um, the ongoing saga of the maintainer multi-organizational requirement. Um, uh, and then if people have other business, other things that they're working on that they want to bring up. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so this is an official meeting of a CNCF working group. Um, as such, it is subject to the CNCF code of conduct, which all of you are familiar with. Um, it is also being recorded and shows up on some CNCF YouTube channel somewhere. Um, so do keep that in mind. Um, uh, and uh, we will get started. So welcome everybody. Um, so um, our first thing is, um, I, we sort of hammered out a little bit of an outline. So a big portion of the work of this working group is simply preparing a whole bunch of written content um, as guidance for the projects. Um, the, um, and this basically falls into two types of content. Um, one is general content about um, developing governance for open source projects. And the second part is um, specific guidance on the CNCF requirements um, at the various levels. Um, an example of the latter being, you know, we need to write a document on, hey, um, I, you know, to become even a sandbox project, you have to adopt the CNCF intellectual property policy. What does that practically mean for your project, right? What do you actually have to do other than saying you adopted it? Um, the, um, um, so I've got a relatively large checklist of items here. 
Um, the, um, the other thing is a lot of these items are going to overlap heavily with contributor growth because things like a contributor ladder is both a contributor growth document and a governance document, right? Because obviously maintainers have certain governance rights, um, but contributor growth is how we decide who becomes a maintainer, et cetera. Um, the, um, so we'll be collaborating on those. Um, my main reason to put this up was actually honestly for people to volunteer to take individual things um, uh, as you go. Um, the, um, so um, we've got that issue there, which is linked off of the um, table of contents. So, um, any comments, thoughts? Volunteering. Are any of these, sorry, I'm still getting up to speed. Are any of these work in pro progress already? Do we have bits and pieces of these and other documentation? Um, I have a bunch of bits and pieces. My next thing to do is to actually start pasting them into the repository as PRs. Um, uh, because there was some holdup on starting the working group. I've been in parallel for general governance advice. I've been in parallel working on Red Hat's new edition of the open source way. Um, governance chapter. And so I need to paste a lot of that in and modify it to be suitable for the CNCF stuff. Um, so that's the main work in progress I have. For a lot of these other things, honestly, we can pull examples from the projects who've already done them well. Um, like for example, the role documents, there's a couple of projects that actually have good, this is who's a member of the project, this is who's a contributor, this is who's um, a maintainer. Um, sections already written up. Um, and, and a lot of our documentation can be just pointing to those as examples. Um, so yeah, um, so um, people have stuff, it is not in our repo, is the current status. Okay, so we can just kind of search around and look at some of the projects and pull together yeah. something that looks reasonable. Yeah, and stuff from outside the CNCF too. Hey Josh, I had a question for the how to create, how to write ones, where yeah. we're going to have uh, templates that came from yeah. contributor growth. Yeah. Are we just going to walk them through, like, here are the things you should be thinking about? Yeah. Is that what, is that what it's going to be? Yeah, that's my thought, right? Because okay. they have to, I'm taking from the perspective of, hey, they have to have this how to contribute document in order to be accepted yeah. into incubating, I think. And um, I mean, ideally they have it for sandbox, but I think it's a requirement at the incubating level. I mean, the sandbox so, form asks them about it actually. Yeah, oh, it does. Okay, so maybe they have to yeah. have it for sandbox. Yeah. And, um, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, it is on my list for sandbox. Yeah. And so here it is. And so, I mean, that's one of the ones where, um, you know, and this is why I was asking you for contributor growth, whether we should actually be working on a shared folder for this because it's going to be the same document. Um, and the only thing we'd be supplying from a governance perspective is a little wrapping around saying, hey, this is a requirement at the sandbox level and this is, you know. Yeah, yeah, so so what we're gonna have is the template, which says like you can copy paste it, use it, and yeah. then there's gonna be inline markdown comments essentially, that'll help you with optional parts or like things to think about um, but then it sounds like we'd also have in the governance part or governance I, will help I create want, a walkthrough yeah. essentially. So well, I'm except I don't, I don't know what the template looks like. Is a walkthrough actually required? Um, the template's going to have, like I said, markdown comments. So if you open up and edit it in GitHub or markdown editor, you're going to see those little grayed out HTML comments that say like, um, do you do this? Do you do that? What should you think about? Okay. Um, if your project has this, use this section. If your project has a DCO, for example, use that. Um, but it may be nice to have another introductory document that just says why it's important, what we're doing, what's the goal. Because like the template just talks about the brass tacks of like, okay. this is how you fill it out. But I think sometimes people don't always understand how it's going to be used and why we care about it as a requirement, if that makes sense. So I think yeah. there's still value in having the introductory like uh, 
this is why you should care setting. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay, so I'm writing this down. Um... What I'm struggling with right now is I don't know where to put the template or where we would put this document as soon as we start writing it. You know, like right now it's living in like Google Docs, mm -hmm. but I prefer to be submitting PRs at this point. Yeah, I've kind of taken the perspective that um, if we're in brainstorming mode, that we do it in something like a Google Doc or HackMD, because it it's very hard to do line item contributions via a PR. Um, and then, you know, when you've got a first draft, I mean, this is how I intend to do the sections that I'm doing. When I have a first draft, then submit that as a PR. Yeah, but where does it go once we have the PR? Um, like we talked about having a template repo that someone could actually just fork and use as a brand new repo that follows all the CNCF guidelines and suggestions. But I can't make that. So if we could get someone to make that, that'd be awesome. Okay. And then all of our contribution guidelines, things like that. I got pushback when I talked about putting it in the other existing repo from people. And it sounded like maybe it wasn't the right spot for this stuff. So maybe it should be going in our repo. What, what other repo? The CNCF, is it called? Contribute. Contribute? Yeah. Okay. This I, is what I was I, talking about in Slack the other week that I, I was kind of confused because either I misunderstood where were we, we were going to be putting some things like the division of the repos of SIG work versus things we we're putting out for people to consume, like our guidance. So I just don't know where to submit stuff. If we could just clarify that. Like if yeah, I, I don't know how to contribute. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I kind of assumed <laughs> that I was going to put stuff in the um, in the R repo until officially approved by the TOC okay. um, or adopted at a SIG meeting and then we would move it to some more official location. But that's fine. Um, yeah, that that's just that's just me. I, th I think this needs to be an agenda item for the general SIG meeting. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't necessarily know all these repos. Yeah. Yep. That's that's fine. I'm just at the draft stage for some of my work that yep. goes with that con contribution bullet point. Okay. So I'm just like rearing to put it somewhere and get it out of the Google Doc. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I would like to put my name under how to contribute, I guess. Cool. Okay. Do you want to write the preface? Yeah, the basically just like level setting, like what are your goals when you're writing this? Okay, you cool. Know? Yeah. Okay. And I could probably sign up for the how to write role definitions with some examples because fair bit of experience doing that. Is there much overlap with any of the other other working groups or other parts of of the SIG that I should be aware of for that one? Um, I feel like that might intersect a lot with contributor ladder. Yep. In the contributor growth working group. Yeah. And the yep. contributor growth working group, but I feel like yeah. let's just all do the work. We'll, well figure it out later. Yeah. If so, does it make sense to have the same people? So you said you'd help out with the contributor ladder. Does it make more sense to have you do the role definitions? I could do like a, how to do the leadership selection instead, if that's. I think that makes easier. a lot of sense because yeah. contributor growth isn't working on that one at all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I can take the how to do leadership selection as a starting point. Okay. Um, and because I've been hip deep in this, I'm going to be starting out with, um, well, actually I want to start out with the more general stuff, which is, um, working on the requirement side of things to say um, what is required for governance documentation, because that's something I actually need to push through the TOC. 
because I actually want the CNCF to have a more refined view of what what amount of governance is required at different levels. Because right now, basically, there's this requirement at um, the incubating level that you have a governance.md um, file, but no particular requirements on what's in it. Um, and so I want to refine that with the idea that you would have a certain amount of sort of skeletal governance at incubating and then much more mature, complete governance system um, at uh, graduated. Um, and the TOC will obviously need to discuss that once I come up with a draft. So that will be the next part that I'm going to take, take on. Okay, so. So that's a bunch of things, and then we can keep working on filling in other stuff. Um, the, um, and we need to generally settle on the, with the SIG on, on where this is all targeted to live, um, um, which is, is obviously a question. Um, when, when, when we have it complete, when we have the, the you know, relatively complete and merged with content from the other working groups. Um, I also have some open questions that I need to take up. Um, I'm not sure with who. Um, I guess uh, probably with the TOC about whether or not we should be responsible for providing advice around developing security issue handling guidelines and developing release process documentation, um, or whether there's somebody else in the CNCF um, who's responsible for that. There is there's a release process requirement um, at one of the levels of graduation. And for that matter, in my experience, the release process is an expression of de facto governance because as part of the release process, you often have to pick and choose which things actually go into a release. Um, the, um, and often if that's not documented, it results in um, decisions made by one group being reversed by another. Um, the um so okay uh does anybody have anything more to say about that i i had a quick question this is sure. jennifer um cool. when i look at the content tracking uh i'm not sure i'm i'm new to contributing to this group um one of the things i'm wondering uh, is there something that's going to cover like project um maintenance in terms of like abandonment of a project or killing a like not killing a project or like graceful shutdown like uh is is that even on the radar is that something that would be covered in somewhere here i that would be yeah it actually wasn't something i had on the list um and that would obviously be complicated for a cncf project that would be another thing that would need to go to the TOC after we came up with a suggested document. So if you want to add things on that because you want to write them or you already have material for them, then then please do put that in a comment and I will add it to the general list. Um, and Paris actually has another one, which is um, uh, communications. Although I thought communications was elsewhere in our SIG. Paris? What are you asking not, there? Not necessarily. Um, okay. Just like how you actually operate the said transparency that you say you're providing. Um, oh, okay. Like, or uh, best practices for recording meetings and uh, that kind of stuff. Like I call them the governance transparency vehicles. But to Jennifer's question too, I, um, I think that actually falls in line with the archiving process that the TOC has. But at the same time, I don't know if it's extensive yet because they, they don't have many projects that have gone through that process. So I don't 
I think your efforts could be fruitful there. That was kind of my TLDR as well. <laughs> sure. Okay, so I'm adding these to the general advisory list. Okay. Yeah, and if you think of something later, please put it in the comments on the issue and then I'll add it to the list. Because, um, I mean, I'm basically seeing us having a large collection of documents about project governance. Um, um, uh, the other thing actually, oops, the other thing I need to add here is, um, a resource list because we also want to have a list of external resources. Because there are going to be lots of things that we want to point to as general good advice for projects that aren't necessarily going to get copied into our repo for whatever reason, possibly because we don't have um, access to them. Um, so, okay, anything else? Cool, okay. So the next thing is um, I want to report back for anybody. Um, uh, and we need to get this in the notes. Um, I want to report back for anybody who wasn't able to attend the TOC meeting earlier this morning. So the TOC meeting earlier this morning decided to discuss um, the um, maintainer multi-organizational requirement. So there's a requirement within um, the CNCF that in order to reach the graduated level, you have to have a maintainer from you have to have maintainers from more than one um, in, uh, organization, by which they mean more than one employer. Um, and this has become an issue for some projects that have struggled to attract um, maintainers, uh, projects that were generally originated at a single company and have struggled to attract maintainers um, who don't work for that company for a variety of reasons. Um, the um, um, Uh, so a lot of the discussion ended up setting around right before the meeting, um, Alexis, I'm forgetting Alexis's last name, but um, dropped a thing of his suggested sort of workaround for this, for some of the projects which are struggling, um, which is an advisory on how to create a steering committee. Um, um, I, as, a workaround for not having a, enough of a variety of code maintainers. Um, the um, the TOC was generally warm to this idea with guide rails um, because the TOC's main concern with requiring multi-organization is that a project not be run for the exclusive benefit of a single company. Um, and by having a steering committee who actually had the ability to selectively override um, the uh, pool of maintainers, uh, particularly in terms of promotion of new maintainers, um, that that would be one way to address that. Um, the, um, you can take a look at the, and so that was, that was most of the discussion. Um, I actually expected more discussion with people theoretically challenging the multi-organizational requirement um, because there have been people within the CNCF ecosystem, um, particularly a couple of projects um, that are single organization right now um, who are unhappy with the requirement, um, but nobody on the call challenged the requirement. Um, they were a lot more focused on you know, what are our workarounds for projects that are having a lot of trouble fulfilling the requirement, even though they fulfill all the other requirements. Um, one of my thoughts in there was, um, and I've already requested this from Alexis, that we incorporate this, his steering committee advisory document um, in some form into our own documentation. 
because it actually is with some cleanup um, a good document for hey here's how you create a steering committee if you need one in order to fulfill CMCF governance requirements. Yeah, I think it makes sense for that to be under our stuff. Dims, I thought you had some thoughts. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry, First. be lurking. Yeah. <laughs> so what, I'm trying to figure out the threat model. Um, so, or uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's, it's who are we trying to protect against or what are we trying to protect for um, by adding the diversity uh, in the maintenance ship? It's... We are trying to make sure that people are welcoming and you know will mentor incoming folks and add them. Um, so when also when they take technical decisions and they think about what to do next, they will do it in an inclusive fashion. Um, so basically, we are we will end up stripping away all those things uh, because. Uh, because of this, uh, and it's it's going to be the default, right? People will say, "Oh, we started uh, in the sandbox as a single company thing," and there is a clause in here saying, uh, "Okay, you can just add a steering committee and add two people from somewhere, uh, you know, outside the project to oversee what is happening here." And lo and behold, uh, you know, we don't have to try. We don't even have to bother about doing anything else that we need to do uh, to build up a community of on the technical side, not on the user side or, uh, you know, from the outside of the, so th that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I heard you saying that in the TOC meeting this morning and I was actually, I share some of the same concerns. And one of the things I wanted to get a feel from the TOC is like, are they actually okay with this? Because this is obviously different from the previous requirement um, and what they've said the previous requirement meant. Um, that said, the reality is um, that we actually have a number of projects already in the CNCF, including graduated projects that have what I call figurehead maintainers. Maintainers who are on the list in order to meet the multi-organizational requirement who are not actively contributing or reviewing code. Um, and, you know, and without having like, you know, semi-annual in-depth audits of how stuff actually gets reviewed and approved within projects, um, I don't see a way to prevent that. And so then the question is, would a project with a steering committee that actually had people from multiple organizations be worse than a project with figurehead maintainers? Um, so basically we'll be moving figurehead maintainers into steering, that's it. Right, and that's one of the things- Nothing, one nothing my, else is gonna happen. Right, one of my comments on the document is, um, is how do we actually tell whether or not the steering committee is doing anything, right? Because the steering committee that is not in any way involved with the project is not actually solving the problem. Because you can appoint a steering committee and then they can never meet, you know, or they can meet and the meetings have no content. Um, and at least with figurehead maintainers, I can look at people's GitHub history and see who is not actually doing any coding on the project. Um, and for that matter, the CNCF can check whether or not they actually have rights to merge things. Wait, um, wait, wait. Can I, can I stop yeah. you for one second? Yep. You said people who aren't doing any coding on the project. Maintainers, we want to encourage maintainers who don't just do coding, right? Yeah. Well, like coding or maintainers docs. who do, yeah. who show up to meetings, do project management, contribute to design, but they may not be committing code that often. Yeah. They still count, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, Sorry. The, um, 
But I think I would say even for those people, it's critical that they actually have the physical rights to approve things. They do, yeah. But um, you may not be able to look at like a, a yeah. GitHub activity graph to be able to yeah. prove it. You may have to look at like uh, agendas and see that they came yeah. to the meetings. And stuff yeah, like and I, I think, um, yeah, and I think part of this then ends up, part of this ends up tying in with um, dealing with other things like Paris's first question of the, you know, how do you keep the communications open, right? Because if you have a situation where you have these non-code maintainers who are mainly on the project management side, so they're not generating a lot of GitHub content that you could monitor via GitHub, um, and then the project is not taking minutes for its meetings, for like mm -hmm. it's it's yeah. it's a biweekly development meeting, then you have no way to tell whether that person is doing anything at all, um, except by dropping in and interviewing people, which is very time consuming. So we need to sort of think about that. And I think um, as Dim's point out, by moving the problem, we actually make it harder, right? Because now, for the extra steering committee members, um, if they don't have direct rights to merge things in the code and the docs and the planning stuff, then it's going to be even harder to tell if they're doing anything. Um, they, they, it'll be even easier to create figureheads. Um, uh uh, and uh, uh, then I went from the opposite side. Okay, fine. Let's have steering members. Let's have, say, seven people in total, five maintainers uh, of uh, of the representing company, and two from outside, like user groups or whatever. Right? Then yeah. what are the carrots and sticks they ha the, those two people have over the other steering members and the maintainers to actually get anything done? Right? It's literally, there's zero carrots and zero sticks. So, and the, one of the answers that came was, oh, we'll have uh, uh, somebody from the TOC to actually um, oversee what is happening. It's like, how is that going to help? Like, it's not like yeah. you will take every small um, request or an incoming PR back up the chain to the CNCF TOC um, to adjudicate, right? Um, so it's it's like fine. We'll have a figurehead. We'll have a figurehead. Just make it plain that it's a figurehead. L let's not try to say that they'll yeah. do anything more than be figureheads, right? The well, my perspective on this and what I would put into what I would recommend putting into our suggestion for the steering committee workaround, if the TOC wants to embrace this, is that the steering committee must have the ability to appoint maintainers. If they can't do this, the entire steering committee is a figurehead as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that actually eliminates a lot of the, you know, um, potential for the steering committee to statutorily be a figurehead. Now we have the problem of the steering committee members not being at all active. Um, you know, that is, they could have the ability to do that, but not exercise it. Right, but the steering committee itself could be outnumbered, right? The number of uh, people not from the company um, will be lesser than the people from the company. So uh, it's not like they could have the power that they can't exercise it because there are uh, there's only two people out of seven and they won't be able to. Oh, now that was actually one of Alexis's recommendations that for the steering committee workaround, um, no one organization would be could have a majority of seats. Okay. Now, that obviously, if a bunch of those seats are not showing up, um, then that doesn't help. But yeah. Right. Um, so uh, this kind of like reminds me of like uh, the uh, Apache Software Foundation, where the the ASF board can kick out everybody who is maintaining a specific pro project. Yeah. So. Um, that does make me feel better from that sense. But then there, the Apache board is not like the steering committee in the sense that they are overseeing everybody. So in our case, it would be the CNCF TOC and not the steering committee itself. Yeah. So then it almost feels like 
why do we even need the steering committee? Um, and just the CN they could be a, somebody from the CNC of TOC who is overseeing, and they can get the TOC to pull the plug when the time is right. So, uh, yeah, that that was the other thing that was going through my mind. Yeah, that, that just having yeah, um, the um, <laughs> so one of the things that Alexis, if you look at the long argument that we had on the issue. Uh, one of the things that Alexis was suggesting actually was active TOC oversight. My problem with that is that historically the CNCF TOC has not been very active and has had difficulty keeping up with merely the project approval mm -hmm. um, workload. And so, I mean, CNCF currently has whatever it is, 65 accepted projects. The idea that the TOC would somehow actively be watching these projects for problems not going to happen yeah yeah the um and and honestly even be able to recognize problems if they saw them right, right. the because like i can tell you i've been asked to do a review of a couple of projects right. that the toc thought were problems and each of those reviews took me probably an entire day um right. um of time um so so the other uh, angle that yeah. I kind of was talking about in the meeting was like steering is supposed to be non-technical, um, yeah. at least on the Kubernetes side. So on the technical side, who is going to like figure out if the design itself or design changes that are being proposed will actually be, you know, inclusive. Um, and, you know, if it's pluggable, then it's more than one vendor, whatnot. Right. So, uh, and if the uh, if the user committee members on the steering committee feel that it is not inclusive, when will they even know that there is like a design in progress and the design might not be uh, up to, you know, they might not be satisfied with the design, right? So on the design side, there's going to be still a hole. Uh, by the time they get to know that there's a feature in progress and there is it, things might not work the way they would expect and things might be uh, going wrong, uh, it'll be too late by the time they raise an alarm, right? That's the other thing that I was thinking about. On the technical side, there is no coverage. Uh, there's coverage on the side of like, okay, we are, re re from an organizational point of view, I'm a bank and I'm relying on this software to work and I'm, uh, I want to make sure that it works all right and they take our inputs. But then those set of people in the steering will not have visibility into what is happening. Right. So that was the other uh, tack on it. Open design um, in open stack terms. Yeah, the, um, it's obviously a concern. Um, I mean, for that matter, there's just the concern of the potential dynamic that if you have a, you know, say a seven member steering committee and three members work for the company that employs the majority of maintainers, um, and those three are all of the technical people on the SC, then the remaining four are going to tend to believe anything that they say about, hey, what do these API changes mean? Um, I mean, I guess the question is, you know, again, Is this a worse situation than um, projects selecting for maintainers who don't otherwise qualify for maintainers? Obviously, there's an alternative to all of this, which is the TOC says, hey, until you can attract a real maintainer who does not work for the majority company, you stay in incubating. Um, the um, And 
Yeah, that's the hard call that uh, CNC, the TNC, TOC doesn't want to make, right? That's the problem right. here. Right, and, and I'm not going to name any projects, but I would say demonstrably the TOC has already refused to make that call. They, they have already graduated a number of projects where I can tell you the, um, the maintainers um, for the non-majority employers are not actively involved. Um, so, um, the, uh, and so it almost feels like we shouldn't, we should, we shouldn't bother with, with the maintainer diversity at all. It's, it's like, why, why color over uh, stuff that we want to just do a figurehead over and just take it out. Right. I mean, if people don't believe it and they, uh, so, why pray to a false god, right? Okay. Okay. So your general perspective would be that you don't really feel like the steering committee workaround actually does anything. Um, except, except when it's sincere, you know, because, because I mean, you can't say on the top end that there is, it is completely possible to have a project with a sincere steering committee who's actively involved, that having a steering committee is their way to get input and strategic direction from their end users, which is an idea I really like, um, you know, and, and all of those things, um, that it's you could actually easy. have this. Yeah. yeah. It's very easy to game and it's very easy to there's no carrots and no sticks basically yeah uh, th that that's the problem here um the um i also tend to believe that projects that have that kind of sincere sincerely varied steering committee probably already have um multiple maintainers working for multiple organizations anyway if nothing else, at least a doc maintainer, you know, even if they don't have a code maintainer. Um, the, um, cause that's, that's one of the other things that I strike here to say, you know, the idea that a project can't even find a doc maintainer from one of their end users strikes me as a little ridiculous. Right. And this is not to take away from the fact that P P projects can choose to have steering and they could choose to have steering that is diverse, right? Uh, so if projects want to do that, that, that's awesome. Like, you know, Kate already does it and other, they can follow the same pattern, but they shouldn't follow that pattern for the diversity's sake. Yep. So um, do other people have thoughts on this? What does a project get going from incubating to graduating that is so gosh darn important that they that we're bending over backwards to skip I think key health metrics about the community aspect of the project? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's marketing, Carolyn. It's marketing. I mean, just oh, getting money. into sand okay. sandbox, <laughs> going from sandbox to incubating, uh, yeah. it's, it's all marketing. Uh, they, okay. All the companies use this, um, you know, just getting into CNCF, uh, into sandbox, even though we are saying it's not really a full project, people use that for marketing to um, their uh, employees, to their customers. And yeah. when they incubate, when they reach incubate, incubation or graduation, they make a really big deal about it uh, in all their marketing materials and uh, when they talk to customers, um, it's well, it's a really big deal. And I you know, mean, if, they, if they love marketing so much, then why don't they market to their end users and community? I mean, that was a great point about not even having a, an end user doc contributor or something like that. Like, it's incredibly valuable to your project. Why not take advantage of it? Yeah, I don't get it. I don't understand why we should like. And that is the Add exact these problem. Weird band right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Why can't we actually dive into these projects where there is a 
problem cu- currently yeah. and come up with creative ways to actually do the right things right yeah let's help them they don't want to be helped that's a problem here well then they can yeah. stay in incubating <laughs> yeah and so where that's yeah where that's come from is yeah something saying in incubating and, and a big part of the graduate it is um there's a particular project there's actually a couple of projects that are incubating that as code are several years old and actually have commercial adopters and some of those commercial adopters are asking the project leads why are you still in incubating ah uh, okay okay um the i mean the other thing i'll say is the multi organization requirement is not necessarily fairly applied across the cncf yeah okay um the um uh how how diligently it is pursued tends to partly hinge on the project and the majority company's relationship with the various cncf committees um so the um um but but the big thing is you know is that a lot of these projects feel like hey you know code wise the project is mature incubating implies that it's not complete and our users are getting antsy about that yeah okay yeah and and in my case and one of the things that i've actually brought up to the ceo in a previous meeting is i you know really think we should think about for some of these projects spinning them off to their own linux foundation holding area um because um from my perspective the cncf is for common property projects you know projects that don't belong to a single company and that if you wanted to belong to a single company you didn't need the cncf um i uh, and you know and and you know but once they've been once the ip has been assigned to the cncf we can't give it back legally speaking the um, ip is assigned ip and the code is assigned to linux foundation not cncf see linux foundation right so right. linux so, Fund- yeah yeah but the linux foundation can't give it back right yeah exactly right um it needs to live somewhere within the nonprofit arena at that point but the linux foundation does have other spin-offs that are essentially company controlled um and and that could be another one um but the toc both this toc and the previous toc have been super reluctant to even consider that for any projects um so um i actually kind of want to get a feeling from everybody in the meeting here about whether or not we're okay and obviously i will finesse a write up on this but whether or not we're okay saying hey guidance on steering committees is super well on, on steering committees is super welcome because it's a thing that projects do but we do not see a steering committee as a legitimate workaround for the multi organizational requirement um is that a statement that that everybody currently in the meeting is is comfortable with uh don yeah i would agree with that absolutely Wait, okay, we got one more person in the meeting. Who is that? Oh, Jennifer. I I would agree with it. Okay. Okay. Um so I will write something um and then uh post it to our Slack um and tag all of you folks um so that you can actually look at it before we pass it on to the TOC. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, uh, Josh. Yep. Thank thank you for bringing that up and hashing that out and everything else. Um the um so cool. Okay. So, uh we got a little bit of time left. Does anybody have anything else for governance working group? Nope. 
Okay. Um, let me just pop open the issues to see if there's any assigned issues that we have not already discussed. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo, content tracking. Um, uh, committer versus maintainer is still open because of contributor growth. We've obviously been addressing this. Um, by the way, in this whole discussion, we were talking about maintainer, um, but um, the um, one of the things that I've actually recommended in my other documentation around this requirement is that we actually use the term senior leadership group um, with a bunch of specific requirements attached to that because some projects already use the name I can committer or maintainer to mean something very different from how most of us use it. And we don't want to define nomenclature for projects. Um, uh, one of the things outstanding there is also helping with the end user requirement, which is not a governance requirement so much, but doesn't really live anywhere else. Um, the, um, and I still have, that's still on me because I still need to talk to Cheryl about it since she was not in the TOC meeting where we discussed it. Um, uh, diversity requirement again, uh, survey is out but Paris isn't here, so I can't ask her about closing the issue. And that is it for our open issues. Okay, well, if nobody has anything else, um, that is all of the stuff. Everybody has content they're working on. I will get back to everybody with the sort of draft letter to the TOC, so you can submit your revisions to it, and then we can send it off as governance working group. Um, and, the um, um, the um, and and then we'll see where it goes from there. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye.